When choosing to use a web proxy within your organization, acceptable use is probably the primary um, use case, I'd say, for deploying something like a web proxy. And when we start off with thinking about acceptable use, you go, okay, well, within our company, between the hours of nine to five, what should people be doing with the internet? And then a lot of times our starting point is gonna be URL filtering. This is gonna control access to websites and it's gonna be based on the category. So you don't need to know every single URL. If you know a URL, you wanna block it, great, that's easy. But the categories, you know, if you wanna block a certain category of website, well, there's gonna be new URLs every day that come up that could potentially be part of this category. So keeping up with the internet and all the various sites could be, I think, a lot of work for the administrators, especially trying to keep everything patched and locked down. So by leveraging URL filtering and by leveraging the intelligence that we're gonna gather uh, from the ratings that are associated with each of these sites, we can make intelligent decisions. So part of this, again, is category. So let's say that it's gambling. When we look at something like gambling, we go, is this something that our company allows between the hours of nine to five? You might say, of course, we are an online poker site. <laughs> and of course, that would be appropriate for you. Unless you're working in an online casino, it's probably not something that your users should be doing. Um, in that case, we could say, this is a category that I wanna block. You might have thousands of websites that have to deal with online poker. We're gonna grab all of them with one single chat box. Now, in addition to just the category being something that may or may not be appropriate for the organization during work hours, um, we've got this concept of reputation. Is it a site that's known to deliver malicious content? So you could have a site that isn't malicious in nature, but other people use it as a transport to push down malicious content towards other people. Well, in that case, again, we could say, I don't want anybody going there, it's a dangerous site, um, we just wanna block it. So that has to do with locking down access to certain destinations. And this is, like I said, it's something that's been around for many years. When we talk, talk about leveraging the WSA, and we wanna go deeper into acceptable use, we can actually look at what's happening within the application. This is sometimes called AVC, which stands for Application Visibility and Control. In the old days, we used to just call it Deep Packet Inspection. The reason that they keep using these additional acronyms is because we keep piling on more and more intelligence. So we go, when we look at the payload of the packet, what's happening? And it's not just within this one packet. It's within the context of the entire communication. So look at the form of the communication, look at the type of URLs that are being interacted with and the way that they're interacting, look at the queries that are coming in, look for things like you know, potentially SQL injection. Um, as files are being processed back and forth, do we wanna take a closer look at the files that are being sent? Uh, if information's being passed that's encoded, should we go to the trouble of decoding it and then doing another round of analysis based on the strings that it includes? Um, application visibility and control is gonna give us uh, that deeper visibility into what's actually happening. When we take a look at URL filtering, again, this is just the process of filtering the addresses the organizations are trying to communicate with. So if you're trying to connect out to uh, a pornography website from work, it's gonna see that and it's gonna say, you know, unless that's your business, you probably really shouldn't be there during work hours. So we can, again, control these types of things. As people take work equipment out into the field, they're on the road, they're connecting from hotels, again, we can tunnel all that traffic back to our central headquarters and wash it with the WSA. Alternatively, we can use a cloud-based solution where we pass all the traffic through a tower, we apply our policy at that tower, and then the traffic's gonna be scanned as it goes out. So again, what is this gonna give us from a, a business perspective? Uh, workforce productivity, Resource consumption, we're obviously gonna limit it. Uh, compliance requirements is necessary. Corporate policy enforcement. A lot of times people sign up, um, you know, the, the day that you get hired, you sign all these packages and papers saying this is what I agreed to, this is you know, what I will do, this is what I'll not do on work time. Um, sure, they agreed to it, but we could actually enforce it through policy, leveraging the WSA. Additionally, we've got workplace occupational health and safety. What happens if somebody's viewing some type of content, somebody else walks by, they're shocked, they're outraged, now they wanna you know, potentially sue the company for what they've seen and can't unsee? Sounds like a mess. Let's just block that content right at the firewall. 
Additionally, this could tie back into legal liability concerns and even get into your reputation. So just to clean up our web traffic, it's a pretty wild internet out there. If we wanna limit only specific categories to being allowed and blacklist the rest, we could do that. So looking at URL categories, right? The URL filtering engine basically does this. It performs the filtering based on the use of categories. And where we might say this is, um, you know, hostile content, this is unhostile content, this is appropriate, this is inappropriate. Well, they give you a pretty granular level of doing so with 85 different categories and the ability for you to come up with custom categories with custom URLs. So there's a lot of intelligence that goes into this. These categories are constantly being updated with new domains all the time. Uh, and then of course, when we make our rules, we tend to build rules based on those categories, keeping it very broad from an administrative perspective, but keeping it extremely granular and high resolution from an application perspective. So looking at the URL categories a bit further, there's different actions that are gonna be supported based on those predefined categories. So when I see certain types of traffic, what is it that I wanna do? Do I wanna block it? Do I wanna monitor it? Do I wanna send a warning and go, you know, you probably shouldn't go here, but you can click to continue. And it goes, okay, the user got a warning and they decided they still wanted to go out. Um, it could be quota-based or even time-based. It's like, okay, well, you can read about um, firearm reviews, but you can't do it for more than 30 minutes a day. If you're looking at gun pictures all day on your computer, you're probably gonna scare the other people in the office. Uh, or again, maybe it's something that's totally uh, off limits within the company. Again, every company is gonna have what's appropriate or inappropriate uh, internally, right? Maybe at a, a, a vegan restaurant, they don't want you looking at pictures of steaks, whatever the scenario is. We've got the ability to come in here and see what's appropriate, what's inappropriate for our organization. Again, if you think, um, you know, maybe nobody should put pineapple on pizzas. I get in debates about that all the time. I'm from Florida, I think, <laughs> ham and pineapple is totally normal. You could create custom URLs that had to do with that and put that in your own category. Um, kind of a ridiculous example, but I just want you to stretch your mind and go, okay, what's kind of a silly scenario? If you could name those websites, you could probably block it. If you think an Xbox is better than a PlayStation, we could probably create some content filtering rules around that. Um, these could be really silly. At the same time, they could be very, very effective. They could be very not silly when it comes down to corporate compliance and especially trying to avoid things like lawsuits that could come out of what people are looking at on the internet. So this ties back to DCA or what they call their Dynamic Content Analysis Engine. Uh, basically, a web request comes in, we're gonna go ahead and do that URL lookup and we go, okay, just looking at the URL itself, is it bad? If the URL is bad, we can toss that query out and this is kind of like what we've seen in some of the other solutions. If we can make a intelligent decision based on very simple information, like a DNS request, I go, oh, if it's trying to go to, and we've got some terms identified down here. If the website request is trying to go to amateurporn.com, and uh, this is a government agency, I go, there's no way anybody's supposed to be going here during the middle of the day. So I can drop it based on the DNS request. I don't have to look at the content and it's smart enough to look at images and figure out if some images are inappropriate. It's, um, I don't have to look for malware. I don't have to look for viruses. I can look at that DNS lookup right off the bat and know that this is no good. Um, now for other websites that are not gonna be as obvious as this, we can leverage a very intelligent engine, which is what this is all about. And that engine is gonna give us a score the score based on a confidence rating that something is not appropriate for the organization. So a lot of times if we look at this, it was very rigid. It was a hit or a miss based on some definition file. Well, based on the ability to use lots of different characteristics in the analytics of the data, we can come up with a confidence score and then apply that confidence score. It's gonna give us much better um, capabilities than we would have had with a static list. I mentioned the term application visibility and control. You'll hear this term when you're digging around kind of researching the firewalls as well. This is a, a term that comes up there. And I mentioned previously, a lot of us have been doing this for a while. You may know this as the term stateful deep packet inspection. But deep packet inspection, a lot of times we'd look at that envelope, we'd look at something like a destination port and go, oh, if it's TCP port 80, it must be HTTP content internally. 
That was called port to application mapping, and that was based on knowing that port 80 is gonna be HTTP. Well, it's actually a lot smarter than that. You can use HTTP on non-standard ports, we can still detect it, and then even within that HTTP, we go, well, what are you doing with an HTTP? You see, in the old days, we'd say TC TCP 80 was HTTP, and if it's HTTP, I wanna perform this type of filter. And all of our filters were, I'd say pretty rigid, they were all written in regex, and it was customizable, but it was a lot of work for the user. Um, what we have at our disposal today is amazing. Um, what they call this is, again, with application visibility and control, why is it bigger and better than DPI? Because of what they call micro-applications. Micro-applications are features within an application. So for example, maybe I'm, I'm on Facebook, and I'm playing a Facebook game against other people. You've got the capability to classify that as a micro-application. That is to say, you may not want to block access to Facebook because you market through Facebook. You just don't want people playing games through Facebook. You might allow them to post publicly, but maybe they can't chat. Maybe they can post text, but they can't post pictures. That granular level of control is what we're really gaining here. And they describe it as easy control for hundreds of web 2.0 applications. And they're talking about things there where users are pushing content to the internet. This allows permitting applications such as Facebook while blocking user activities or micro applications within Facebook, like chatting or playing games. Different applications are gonna have different micro application support. Um, it's really pretty exciting. It's something that, that is growing all the time. They're adding more and more capabilities to. So as you do those signature updates, it's something that we can look forward to getting more support, more visibility into the applications. Once we identify something that we'd like or perhaps don't like, of course we can block it. Uh, we can also monitor it. You can restrict it. And we can do things like bandwidth limitations. So AVC manages applications based on the type of application. Is it executable? Is it uh, you know, a web app? Is it for chatting? Um, we can take a look at the application name as well as the application behavior. The engine uses results from URL filtering within the decision process. So remember, when we look at the, the URL filtering, it's not just a matter of like, oh, this is good and this is bad. It's a scale from negative 10 to positive 10. So we can leverage that as one of the criteria when making a dynamic decision for what should be allowed or not allowed. One of the things I mentioned you can use here for an action is policing or rate limiting. So you can say for this type of application, okay, we're gonna allow it, but we're gonna make it go really slow. And you go, what type of application might that be used for? You go, well, BitTorrent. A lot of people look at BitTorrent and they go, oh, that's just for pirating Game of Thrones, or that's just for pirating you know, Black Sails or Breaking Bad or whatever. You go, no, it can be used for other things. You could use Tor to download the latest Linux distro that you're interested in. You might use Tor to download Rainbow Tables or IP blacklists, or I don't know, whatever it is that you want to communicate from, with other people for. So I go, okay, you know what, I'm gonna use Tor I'm gonna allow it, but I'm just gonna rate limit it. I don't want anybody signing, you know, doing a download for maybe a Linux distro on Tor, forget that the Tor client's running, and then burn all of our upstream bandwidth by sharing that particular application. Pretty cool, right? So this gives us a granular approach. Instead of just blocking it outright, we'll make it drip through very slowly. So desire, the applications that are maybe not real desirable, um, but not worthy of blocking, we can actually rate limit it comes in handy. Filtering adult content, um, again, this is probably pretty common for most of you in corporate environments. So we can leverage a couple different things here. Uh, one, of course, URL listing, but we can also touch upon something called site uh, safe search and site content ratings. Safe search is supported by most of the uh, search engines. So you got a list of them here. And basically when content is returned to you, it just has a flag that's like, hey, this is adult content. We can look for that flag and drop it. It's also supported by Flickr, Craigslist, YouTube, etc. As far as turning on these controls, this is all built within our access policy. And what you'll see here are groups of things, right? Like block gambling websites. This is our group. Who does it apply to? All users. What URL cart, uh, category? Gambling. For URL filtering, what are we gonna do? We're gonna block. Pretty straightforward, right? Here we've got uh, limited access to social networking sites. Identification profile. Again, this is who does it apply to? Maybe you apply it to everybody but HR. 
you say, well, nobody should really be goofing off on Facebook at work, but if you're in HR, um, maybe you need to stock you know, potential new hires. Maybe you need to stock existing hires, uh, whatever it is. So a lot of times social networking, we give access to this to the HR department, may block it elsewhere. How about access to banking websites? Should people be checking their bank accounts from work? Yeah, maybe you want to check and make sure that your, your paycheck went through. Um, in those scenarios, we may monitor it, but when you start looking at things like SSL decrypt, we go, we're not going to do SSL decrypt. Um, if there's any type of warnings on site content, I go, well, but it's a finance site. Well, instead of blocking them, we'll just do a warn there. You get the idea. We can take various approaches in terms of the intensity. You know, what do we want to do with this blocking? How do we want to stop it? Should we just monitor? Should we warn them? And again, this can tie into individual categories, and it's divisible by individual groups of users. So tends to be pretty scalable. Of course, you've got your global policy on the bottom here, and you've got your individual policies above it.